This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Doc and Jack. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Looking forward to another great broadcast on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. My guy, Adam, the Jock Strozinski in the house. We got a lot to cover regarding the Lions. Now we finally get a little break where we can start previewing things. Media access is now over for six weeks, so we can look at and recap OTAs, what we liked, what we didn't like. Adam and I must be getting really old because we're going to open with a topic that if you're a longtime listener, we don't usually bring to the table. But I think as we get older, we now have moved into the phase where we are now uh, engaging in this sport. Later on, second half in the podcast, going to take a look at the Red Wings and Pistons. Obviously, when a new hire comes to town for the Detroit Pistons, got a recap I thought was one of the great comments and answers of all time regarding why someone would take an opportunity here in Detroit. And we'll check in with the Detroit Tigers, who are, as we're recording, in the midst of a doubleheader. Because what's happening? Welcoming to the floor, my guy Adam, the Jack Strozinski. What's up, cuz? You know, I think I might be a little bit of a fraud. I'm not really sure. I'm going to need the listeners' help on this because after my impassioned speech last week regarding Liv and the PGA... I turned around on Sunday and I was sucked in, man. I was sucked into the RBC Canadian Open. I was enthralled with the playoff. I was enthralled with the final day. I watched every little bit of it I could get. I watched all of it, man. And I loved it. I thought it was great. And and look, last week, I, I blamed the PGA. I was upset at the PGA. I wasn't upset at Liv. Like, I, I felt like my... My anger was a little bit misdirected, and I felt like it could have been taken as me being upset with Liv, but I was I was so disgusted with the PGA. But then I turn around on Sunday, and I take in everything that I can get as far as the Canadian Open goes, and I loved it. It was great, and I look forward to the U.S. Open, which is going on this week, and I, I can't wait. And, and look, I don't know if I'm, if I'm just a sellout. I don't know if I'm a... If I'm just a loser here, but I really do enjoy the PGA tournament. I really do enjoy PGA golf. I just enjoy golf in general. I'll watch some of the Corn Ferry Tour. I'll watch some of the European uh, Tour. I'll watch some of those guys golf. I'll, I'll take it all in. I don't watch Live because good luck finding Live. It's on the CW someplace between Gilmore Girls and and uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer reruns. <laughs> so like I, I don't know. Good luck finding it, but. I take in and I love golf and I loved what I seen this Sunday. And it, to me, I'm having a hard time emotionally with it because I was so upset last week with everything that took place with the PGA and live. And I'm still really upset about it, but I really do enjoy PGA golf. And I'm just not sure if, if that makes me a bad person or makes me a bad fan or, or maybe I'm a sucker. I'm not really sure, but I loved what we've seen with the Canadian open and I look forward to the U S open this week. No, it doesn't make you any of those things you said. It just makes you a hypocrite. Nothing worse than that. I mean, I just think that, you know, when <laughs> when you have one belief so I'm as bad as I'm as bad as Jay Monahan for the PGA then, huh? I'm exactly. just a hypocrite. You're just a hypocrite. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. You just believe one thing and act in another way. It just happens. No, I I think it's funny when you look at it and you say, for me, obviously, I knew something was wrong with my swing because I had to stand so far away from the ball. And just casually was hanging with somebody at a golf outing maybe a year or two ago. And they said, yeah, bro, based on how short you are. He's like, no offense taken, but you need fitted clubs. He's like, just pony down. Stop being a cheap mofo. Go get fitted clubs. And I'm like, God, I'm not going to invest that much. But, you know, I'm doing well. Why not just splurge a little bit on myself once a year? Just spend some money on yourself. So last year I went to Carl's Golfland, uh, the Birmingham location, and I swung some clubs. And I was trying in between... uh, the Callaway Mavericks and the Taylor made. And I was like, man, these Mavericks are sweet. And he's like, yeah, you know, giving me all the info. And, you know, you hit some good seven irons, some good pitching wedges, a couple awful drives. He's like, okay, 
your swing path is this way. You obviously kind of come over the top, up, 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 up. But he's like, yeah, if you get fitted, he's like, you need to cut like an inch and a half off your clubs. I'm like, mm-hmm. an, inch, I'm like an inch and a half. He's like, yeah, the only thing I'm going to tell you is it's going to take a little bit of getting used to, but just stand a little closer to the ball. And based on your swing, your contact is going to be pretty good. And I was like, okay. So I waited, waited the, the seven days, got the fitted clubs, and oh, my God. I was like hitting irons flush, pure, all over the place. Now, of course, a couple of duffs, a couple of misses here and there, but generally speaking, I can get the ball up in the air and, and it's comfortable. The drives are like everybody else. They go nice and high in the air. I just can't determine if it's going to go to the right, to the left. The only place it's not going to go is straight. So I, I can get around a golf course pretty reasonably with bogey, double bogey for the most part to be enjoyable. So I've had a great time with the Callaway Mavericks and guess what? They don't make them anymore. They've shifted to the paradigm, but I'm a big Callaway fan and I'm a big golf fan. Love the US Open, love ROM. And when obviously you get to cover the Rocket Mortgage and you see just how easy they make the game look, you just have a heightened sense of respect for those that dedicate their time to it. And the RBC, bro, was, was fucking enthralling. It was amazing. You had a Canadian who hadn't, the Canadians hadn't won the RBC, the National Tournament of Canada for 69 years. And you have this playoff with the Europeans, so it had the Ryder Cup feel, and it was amazing. And it had everything. It had intrigue. It had great putts. It had, you know, two guys that aren't known exactly for lighting up the PGA in regards to wins. So it was awesome. I don't begrudge anybody that watches competitive golf. It's intriguing when there's good um, when there's good uh, groupings and good competition. And being that I'm an early bird, I'm up at six, seven a.m. Tournaments that start at seven, I can grab a cup of coffee, fire up the TV, and there'll be some guys golfing, and it's great. So don't begrudge it that you're a hypocrite. It's great. It was great competition. It was amazing all the way around, and I think that those that got a chance to enjoy it really enjoyed the RBC. I thought it was great, and uh, I thought Nick Taylor really would – I mean, come on, because that 80-foot putt that uh, when you see a different angle, yeah. that, that hook was unbelievable in regards to the – It was crazy. It was a crazy putt. It was a crazy putt. Yeah, it was he, absolutely he, he, nuts. It was nuts. And yeah, it was it was it was bonkers, man. And and like, look, I, I think it was cool to to see the Canadians. Basically, that's their tournament, right? So you you go to you go to a hole. Everybody's singing "Oh Canada." I think that's awesome. Uh, you have a Canadian win it. Something that has been done in a very long time. The whole place erupts. I thought it was pretty cool to see one of the PGA golfers get taken out by a security <laughs> guard. I thought that was fun to see. So, I mean, this tournament really had everything, and it was awesome. And, and look, it sucks that it was again marred. This is the second year in a row where this tournament was marred by the discussion of Liv. And it was unfortunate that that Liv casted a shadow over this at the very, very beginning. At the very, very end, though, it was awesome. It'll be interesting to see what takes place this week with the U.S. Open. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the conversation regarding Liv kind of goes. Uh, but I don't know, man. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was an awesome, awesome tournament. You brought up the Rocket Mortgage Classic, and you've got to, you've got to golf it a little bit. They have the, uh, the media day where you can go out there and you can hit a couple balls. That's relatively an easy course, right? Like for PGA golfers, it, it's not uncommon for them to be 18 under. It's not uncommon for them to be 24 under. They can p- pretty much handle that course. You got to golf it. How did you do when you golfed it? Just for, for comparison's sake, you have a guy who can go basically 24, 24 under, and then you did what as a, just an average Joe golfing it? Just your casual 22 over par. You know, I think that uh, a 94 is not a bad score for a guy that plays once a year. I think that it was uh, casual. And here's my story. Uh, Started off amazingly well. The drives and the irons were spectacular. So here's the thing with professional golf, though. Golf requires four facets of your game. The drive, the iron shot, the pitch, and the putt. So like myself, I go out and I hit the driving range once a week. And I proceed to hit 100 iron shots and maybe five drives and go home, call it a day. So, of course, naturally speaking, you go to the course, you drive it, you know, reasonably well, you hit irons reasonably well, you get within 50 yards, and it takes six, seven shots to get the ball in the hole. Yes. Because you're duffing yes. it, you're duffing it all over the place. You don't have that 50-yard club in your bag. Whenever I, I get within 50 it, yards, I'm like, I don't have this club. There's I nothing I can do. I'm it, stuck. Exactly. So it's going 80 yards or 50 yards or chunked, or I don't have the feel, and then you get to the greens. And they're a little bit quick, so you're putting it 50 feet and past. And you'll pre-putt it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
exactly. So it, it was very enjoyable. Um, it was great because uh, it was a foursome. And the other three, one didn't come, and one was an old timer who left after nine holes. So I got to play with another media member, and it was great. And we got through in about four hours. They let us; it wasn't a scramble. Let us play all four balls, and we had a good time with it. A uh, friend of the podcast, Ryan Elke, and his crew was one hole behind us, so we got to laugh a little bit when when uh, the slow people in front of us were handling their business. So we got around in four hours. Some of the courses a little bit rough. It wasn't exactly in tournament condition, but it was good enough to see that, yeah, I think that if you if you drive it straight and you can you can chip and reasonably putt, you can definitely get under, you know, six hundred sixty six every single day. You can get, you know, you can do really well as long as your game is intact. So that's why it's a good test of golf in the field this year, cuz it's going to be amazing. You got Matt Matsuyama. You got Justin Thomas coming. You got uh, a player that I liked watching, uh, Saw. He's a young player that's kind of making his way now, new on the tour, Morikawa. So it's going to be a fun time, man. And Detroit, what I think the PGA Tour golfers love is they make it. we make it a party. People come and they drink, and it's been great. I've walked the course behind the final grouping now the last three years, and you get to just – they let me inside the ropes, and I get to watch – up close and personal. I'm not sure exactly if I'm going to cover it this year because it's July 1st. You know, the, the final day is the first and the second and I want to chill out, but we'll see if I just get out there for fun, just have a couple beers. The viewing area is great. The, the Detroit Golf Club embraced us. They, they, it was great this year because I had forgotten about Media Day and the guy personally emailed and said, hey, John, you want to come out? And I'm like, you know what? Thanks, dude. I really appreciate, I appreciate that. And um, they've been nothing but gracious to the podcast. So I was like, yeah, I'll get out there as best I can. And, uh, you know, get around the course and hack it up. But it was great because what I love about golf is I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to mentally psych myself out. I just say everyone here sucks. And uh, it was great because there was a whole, when we made the turn on the 10th, the guy that invited me was giving out presents. So he's sitting there and I'm like, oh shit, I did something. I'm like, fuck, he's sitting there with a lady. I'm like, oh man, was I not supposed to post something? Did I? I'm like, oh fuck. Every time someone's sitting there watching you as a podcaster, you're like, oh fuck, I, I did something wrong. So I proceed, and I sit there, and he's watching, and I, I line up on the 10th hole, and I just go, I'm ripping this one in my head, and I just go, boom, and I hit it 250 straight with a, like, two-degree curve, and I'm like, yeah, and he's like, good job. I'm like, 250 and straight, that was perfect, and he goes, here, here's a backpack with Detroit Rocket Mortgage logo, appreciate you guys, and uh, look forward to seeing you, and it was nice, nice to get around, it was a beautiful day, it was fun, it was, dude, I played a PGA course, and only 22 over par, baby, it was pretty good, in my days, under 100. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Take that all day. Take that all day, baby. You were under 100, so my goal every year is to break 100. So that's – you did pretty good, man. But it just kind of show goes to show you, like, these guys operate at such a high level. And when you get moments like you got this past Sunday, it's awesome. And no matter what happens as far as the PGA and Live goes, you're not going to be able to take some of those moments away, which is great. It just sucks that – What's going on is going on. It's really unfortunate, but it's what it is, man. Um, you know, it's I, I'm not really sure how we transition from golf to the Lions, but I guess from from one epic moment this past Sunday to to other epic moments on Sundays, could you see and would you be in favor of the Lions being in the Chase Young sweepstakes? One CBS writer has the Lions as one of two favorite NFC North teams to land Chase Young. I know betting odds have the Detroit Lions as the favorite to land Chase Young. Would you be in favor of the Lions going out, giving up a little bit to get a guy who, when he came out of college, he was supposed to be a, a generational edge rusher. He was supposed to be the guy. And I remember when we were going through and we were talking about the draft, we were like, man, we'd give anything for this guy. And we ended up with, um, uh, with um, Okuda, I believe, in that draft. And he was the he was the prime guy. He was the dude that you wanted was was Chase Young. And injuries have kind of derailed bits and pieces of his career. But when he is healthy, he's still very effective. Would you like to see the Lions add that piece opposite of Aiden Hutchinson to go wreak havoc on quarterbacks? Man, it'd be crazy, huh? Chase Young and Aiden Hutchinson, two back to back number two overall picks. That'd be sick in Detroit. Problem is his health. And the problem is that he could, after one year, with his contract remaining, maybe just bolt for a, a significant deal. I just don't think it's in the cards because the Lions have a young edge rusher and James and James Houston, who's in the system. So would they mm -hmm. go outside of that to bring in another talent? I don't think so. I think the, the obvious piece that you need is in the interior. 
So Chase Young, I love I love the idea of a healthy Chase Young with something to prove to come to Detroit. I just don't know if if the Lions want to give up a third round pick capital. You know, you you hear throw in an Aquara or two and a third or fourth rounder and see what happens. You know, it just Brad Holmes doesn't seem like the type to kind of want to ro- upset the apple cart at this point. I think that you maybe would have did it for DeAndre Hopkins, but not for Chase Young. I just don't see it. But I think that if they did it, I wouldn't disagree with it. I would have loved the upside because he kind of embodies, don't you think, what the Lions are looking for? Some Somebody with something to prove in a good situation with Aaron Glenn and with Aiden Hutchinson. Oh, my gosh. You look at the interior playing alongside Aleem McNeil. It would be amazing to have on one side Aiden Hutchinson and the other Chase Young. But the injury risk just makes it too much, I think, of a big too, – too risky to give up capital for him. Yeah, I've gone back and forth on this, right? I, I've been I've been a guy who's like, yeah, it would be awesome to add him. But then I'm also like, realistically, does this really work out and does this benefit the team? Again, like you said, his health is a major concern. He hasn't been able to get through a full season since I believe his rookie year. That's a bit of an issue. So do I want to give up draft capital that could land me another starter down the line – for a guy who might come in just for this year. And my answer to that is, I don't think so. Why do I want to give up control of a guy for four years for a guy that I can have for one year? And I really feel like all this conversation about the defense, James Houston had a hell of a year last year. James Houston was was amazing last year. James Houston played, what, I think seven games, had eight sacks? Like, that's unreal. That's awesome. Granted, he is a th- he is a, a third down rusher. That is what his role is. But he was awesome. He gave you a ton, and I feel like he's a bit of a forgotten man. Like every time you hear everybody talk about this Lions defense and how good it could be, and what they need to do to address the defensive line, James Houston's always a little bit of an afterthought. And hey, look, if I'm James Houston, I'm kind of making mental notes of this stuff, and I'm taking that into the year with me, and I'm going to play with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I believe the way it kind of works, because he was a, a practice squad player, I think his contract's only for two years. So I think he hits free agency after this year. So I'm looking to have a big year if I'm James Houston. There's a ton of guys who cash checks as, as third-down rushers. There's a ton of them out there. James Houston has an opportunity to really help elevate himself. Adding a guy like Chase Young, Chase Young is looking for that big payday because they didn't pick up his fifth-year option. Lions would have to give up a little bit to get him. And I just don't know if I'm the Detroit Lions, if I necessarily see the future benefit to do that. It's one of those things where you would have to get him in, you'd have to get him to buy into the system, and then you'd have to make sure that you have the adequate money to allocate towards him to re-sign him because you don't want to give up a draft pick to bring a guy in and then he bolts and leaves you. And then you're kind of like, all right, well, that didn't necessarily work out. You kind of stunt the growth of a guy like James Houston and you end up again, losing that player that you traded for. So I don't necessarily think it works. I think it makes sense on paper. And I think if you've got betting odds, it makes sense. But I think when you look at the totality of what the Detroit Lions are doing and you look at what the, how they're trying to construct themselves and you look at what they actually have going on, because, again, I do believe James Houston is forgotten about. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear uh, Romeo, Romeo or, or Julian Aquara mentioned as, as another guy who can line up on the outside and add pressure to, to the quarterback. And down the list is always James Houston. I, I feel like he's the forgotten man in all of this, and they've got a guy who can help and do that. Also, you brought back Kaminsky, who had a hell of a year last year. And every time he played, I think there's a weird stat out there. Every time he plays, uh, the Lions basically win the game. Like they end up getting a sack. They end up getting multiple quarterback pressures. And the defense just plays out of its mind whenever he plays. So you've got guys. Now, are they big name guys like a Chase Young? No. But do you get production out of them? Yes. This is the one thing that's been amazing about what Brad Holmes has been able to do. He's gone out and he's basically taken flyers on guys, signed them for one year and was like, hey, show me what you can do. These guys go out there and they do it and the guys love it so much. They're like, hey, can we come back? And he's like, yeah, we only have this much money for you. And they're like, that's okay. I just want to come back and play. It's amazing the turnaround that has happened with the Detroit Lions. Going back to the original topic of, of what we were talking about here, I don't think Chase Young necessarily fits for this team right now. I, if I was the Detroit Lions, if I was Brad Holmes, Unless it is one of those things where uh, Washington is willing to to take a really low day three draft pick, I'm not trading for him. If I can get him on the cheap, I'll do it. 
but I'm not necessarily doing it because I think anything, anything third, fourth, maybe even fifth round is just a little bit too high for me. So the price is just too much for a guy that could bolt. Yeah, it's uh, you look at James Houston. It's just sometimes where you come from. Also, too, in terms of the hype machine, it's hard to hype up a guy that didn't make the team at first and then gets relegated to the practice squad. You're right; his contract does end after 2023. What happened was he was a draft pick, and he didn't end up making the roster, but ended up signing with the practice squad and developing. So his contract runs out in 2023. So the Detroit Lions, when you look at what this player can do. You look at a player that is really, really special and has the, I think, the drive of being, hey, because I'm from, uh, you know, uh, HBCU uh, and, uh, you know, you're not heralded that, you know, you don't get the pub, but he burst onto the scene with a multi-sack game, his first game, and having, you know, the, the sack production that he had. He's going to, he's definitely going to be somebody who's come out and said that, I believe he had eight sacks because I wrote an article. He said he in a recent interview, he wants to have 16 this year. He wants to double his sack total. So, I love a player that has a little bit of swagger that wants to prove. And, and, and you look at the Lions' defense because I think it's a championship-level defense when you look at the potential if you add one or two more high-end players. If you add two pieces, you know, Quinn and Williams, you know, maybe ends up signing a deal with the Jets. But if you added a couple more high-end pieces, when you see what Cam Sutton, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, alongside Kirby Joseph, who had four interceptions in his rookie year, and you realize, man, that can be something with Aiden, with Charles Harris being healthy, James Houston, Aleem McNeil. That it, it, it plays. It plays very well. I think that if you're going to upgrade the team, you probably want to allocate resources more to the defense because the offense has more natural talent, I believe, and has talent that's shown that they can produce at a high level. I just think that the defense, if you want to go from a team – that is just hoping and scratching to get to the playoff to maybe win some games. I think you got to, what, what concerns me is the interior of the defensive line, which concerns a lot of people because you're counting on a rookie and you're counting on John Kaminsky and Isaiah Bugs and Benito Jones, really all journeymen. And you realize, okay, your mission is to stop the run and, and pressure the quarterback. The centers and the guards in this NFL – at the highest level, they they move bodies and they handle business. So I, I just think that on defense, a couple like you're just I feel like you're three pieces away, three players away. One on offense, if you if you need a consistent playmaker, and two to three more players on defense away from where you can say when they get to the playoffs, okay, I'm comfortable they can win the games. So that's how close you are. But I'm just uh, you know the Lions are rolling with the draft and develop plan, and let's see if 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 maybe after this year. When they see what happens when some of these young cats get put in the playoffs, what could potentially happen? Does Brad Holmes say, okay, I can pick and choose two, three free agents that have playoff experience and handle business? I just think that they're taking their sweet time with this rebuild, and uh, let, let's see if the, if the plan takes the next step. Because I'm getting a little bit of whispers online on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. Some people swinging now the other way saying, you know what? You look at what's happening with Jamison Williams, how good can this team be? Some people are messaging. You guys are a little bit, uh, a little bit homerish, and they're looking at nine and eight again um, for the Lions this year. And I was really intrigued by that, wondering why some skepticism has now crept in. But I understand because the pendulum swung so high to the positive that people say, you know what, they wouldn't even be surprised with a nine and eight record because. Jamison Williams is suspended for the first six games. So I wonder, do they believe See, they have enough to start the year? See, I would be surprised with a nine and eight record. I would be shocked with a nine and eight record. This is the thing. I, I think the one thing keeping this team away from being as good as it possibly could be is that defense. I think the defense still has a lot of question marks. Yeah, bringing in Cam Sutton and C.J. Gardner Johnson and, and Mosley, bringing those guys in, yeah, it helps strengthen that that secondary and it helps make that a machine, right? I think Kirby Joseph's going to have a huge huge leap forward. Uh, you get. Um, uh, you get a couple guys back, a couple pieces back. But when you really kind of drill down and you look at everything, you're going to be counting on possibly a rookie linebacker to take a, a monster step in his first year. Uh, you are looking at a, a defensive line that was not very good at the end of last year, but you're counting on that defensive line to basically do what it did 
at the end of the year. And we kind of seen going from year one under Dan Campbell into year two under Dan Campbell. Sometimes you don't you don't hit the ground running. You you kind of trip as you as you get out of the out of the the running blocks and you stumble a little bit and eventually you figure things out. I think this defense will be better than last year, but I don't know if this defense is championship caliber. I think it's it's NFC North championship caliber, right? Like they'll win the NFC North, and I would be disappointed if they don't. But I don't know if this defense, the way it is currently constructed, because like you said, I do believe that they are a piece or two away from really getting put over the top. And, and look, it, it is addressing that interior of that defensive line. It is making sure that your linebacking core is solid. You know, there's been a lot of good talk about Derek Barnes. Uh, probably not going to be a starter, but he is going to be a, it sounds like he's going to be a very important rotational piece. Um, who ends up winning the battle uh, between, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be between uh, Rodrigo and it's going to be between Jack Campbell. Does Jack Campbell steal that position from Rodrigo or or does uh, Rodrigo keep excelling and keep kind of moving the bar? And does, uh, does Jack Campbell come in and basically designate uh, Alex Anzalone as, as a backup? Because remember, this team likes to play two linebackers. You might see three out there because that's their base coverage, but generally this team runs out of the nickel. Um, so what, what is going to happen? Like these, everything up front is still really in flux. And what you've done as far as, as addressing your secondary, you got to count on a guy like Charles Harris to, to really perform. You got to count on him locking down that other side opposite of Cam Sutton. I think he can do it, but again, you're counting on a whole lot. You know, we are at this point, we are kind of writing checks and the money hasn't really cleared the account yet. Exactly. So like we, we might bounce some of these checks, you know? So I think there's a big question mark there. I think offensively this ta- this team is lethal. I think it is, it is unreal what this team could do offensively, but defensively, I still have questions. Absolutely. Very fair analysis and really fair. I think to say that, okay, yeah, we are talking a little bit of smack, you know, but but here's the thing and what's really a pleasant a pleasant surprise when you hear the rhetoric. The the Lions will benefit from being one game short from the playoffs. They know they were one game, one performance, one mistake away from having the success. So I think they're still hungry. Yeah, they hear the 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 buzz and everything like that, but it's absolutely beautiful that the Lions start against the Chiefs and the Seahawks. It's going to be two drag out knockout contests where they could start 0 and 2, but I don't think they'll wilt. I don't think that if they do start 0 and 2, that the season is going to take the form of maybe even having the negativity. Now, of course, it depends how if they if they compete and how they were to take a defeat. Like if Dan Campbell makes mistakes or if Goff, if the Lions lead and Goff throws a pick late and makes a mistake, you know, then obviously then uh, new narratives will be discussed. But I think the Detroit Lions understand it's a long 17-game season. They don't have Jamison Williams the first six games. If you can get to be 3-3, three and three, if you can handle business by the bye week, then you can really start to ramp up. And basically, you get a trade back. You get, uh, you get Jamison Williams back a- a- in week seven with an opportunity to, to handle business. So it was, um, it's going to be interesting to see with these Detroit Lions because – the eyes of the NFL world, the eyes of the uh, – basically the entire city is counting on the Detroit Lions to, to do some things. And I'm wondering if they need to make a splash. As, as, do, as, as we look to other teams, a, a lot of the teams in town probably need to make a splash. The Tigers, the Pistons, and right now, to, to talk about it real quickly, I think the Red Wings obviously need to make a splash this offseason when you look at – what they've done, because I'm jealous, I watched the last, you know, I, I missed the goal bar, bar, uh, barrage, but I knew that the, the Vegas Golden Knights were really in contention and really were dominant with Hill in, in goal and with Jack Eichel all year and with the, the, the top line that they got. And you realize, man, the owner comes out and says, we're winning this thing in six years. They get to the final the yeah. first, they get to the final in first year. They have obviously the pick of the litter with an expansion draft. But they made some good moves. They picked up Jack Eichel. They had a nice goalie situation in, in, in Hill who comes along and, and gets to the job in December. I'm jealous, man. Vegas was lit up for 
uh, for their Stanley Cup run. And what a way to win a clinching game, 9-3, to three, where you just you can skate through the entire third period to have a celebration. With the Red Wings, it was always like butt clinching and two-to-one games, and you're like, Jesus. But I'm jealous because the Vegas Golden Knights kind of built a little bit in a way that you think, well, Steve, you could kind of start to pick up some some players. And I think that with the Pistons and the Red Wings, they've looked at this draft and develop model, and it's taking forever because hockey players take their sweet-ass time to get on the ice. It's like five years you know, you, you draft an 18, 19 year old, and, and it's five years before they even, you know, you get to pick the fruit, you get the juice from the fruit. So, uh, you know, you get the, the benefits uh, of the work that you've done. So, I do think the Red Wings need to make a splash, but I don't know, uh, is it, it who, who is it that would come here that maybe is unhappy or, or can like, I mean, you would have thought it would have been nice if you would have been able to cap Bertuzzi, but they didn't want to pay him. So, I'm just. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that Steve Eiserman takes the next step because my patience is starting to wane just a little bit with the Wings. It's been seven years since – seven years? It's 80% of this podcast. The Wings have not been in the postseason. Yeah, and it's, it's frustrating if you're a Wings fan. But here's the thing. This is what's really important to remember if you're a Wings fan. Going into this upcoming draft, Steve Eiserman has five picks, and I believe it's the top 43 picks. So he's got a ton of draft capital. I look at him to kind of – spill and spend some of that to make a big splash. I do expect him to do something. He has to do something. This team has kind of trudged along for just a little bit too long. It's time to, to kind of kick this thing into overdrive. And you're right. You can take a little bit from what the golden Knights did and how the golden Knights even play golden Knights play this, this really nice North South game where they just kind of open everything up with these long passes, these long passes from the blue line out to center. It's a lot of, it's a lot of making that first pass to get a guy broken free, hitting a guy in stride and getting them up the ice and getting them in behind the defense and just putting pressure on. Like you said, there was a goal barrage in the Stanley Cup final game five. It was unreal. And it's just pressure. Like watching that game, the Florida Panthers couldn't do anything. Florida Panthers would turn the puck over. Next thing you know, it's coming back in on them. They would try to move the puck up. They lose the puck at center ice. Next thing you know, it's coming back in on them. And then you're you're generating two and three shots from, from this barrage that's just kind of hitting you. There, it's just wave after wave after wave. And what happens is it just wears you down defensively. Your goaltender is constantly in a state of frantic because he can't necessarily get set because – it's just coming at him and crashing down on him. Your defense is tired because they're constantly spinning around like a top. You're trying to get your best defensive forwards out there to try to regain possession of the puck, to try to set a little bit of a tone so you can get your offensive guys out there so they can turn this thing around. But you can't because you're just getting hit by this barrage and, and these waves of, of just pressure that keeps coming in on you. But going back to the Red Wings, they can learn from that. They can use that. They can do something like that. Red Wings have two draft picks in the first round. You know who doesn't have a draft pick in the first round? The Ottawa Senators. Ottawa wow. Senators do not. And they've got a guy in uh, Alex DeBrink who is an absolute stud. Farmington Hills native. This guy was incredible. I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago uh, in Chicago. In Chicago, he just posted mind-blowing numbers. Actually, it was 2018-2019 uh, season, posted 41 goals. And then it was last year, uh, in the 21-22 season, posted 41 goals again. So the guy has the ability to score. And in between that, he only played 52 games and posted 32 goals when he was playing in Chicago. So the guy has the ability to find the back of the net. That's what you need. Look, Dylan Larkin, as much as everybody loves Dylan Larkin, Dylan Larkin's a number two. He's, he's, he's another team's Robin, okay? Um, on a really good team, he's probably your third-line center. But you can get away with him as your second line center here. You need to bring somebody else in who can really command that position and put goals in. Look, Alex Kopp is a really nice addition to this team. I was I was ecstatic about that signing last year. All right. Alex Kopp is uh, again, he's probably more a second line player. You don't have a first line center. You don't have that first line player. You go out there and you could make a trade with Ottawa. Again, probably giving up um uh, the, the, the second first round pick that they have, I believe that is number, um, 17 and you can give up one of your 
earlier second round picks. I think they've got like 41, 42, and 43 is kind of the way it works out for the Red Wings. Um, yeah, 41, 42, 43. So you could pair 17 and 41 and probably give them a prospect. And you could probably get this thing done. Now, he's going to command a lot of money, but the Red Wings have cap space. Red Wings have cash. They have money that they can do stuff with. So I think you were, if you were to add him, you were to take some of the pieces that you had from last year and you get a little bit of growth from these guys, I think next thing you know, we're talking about a team that can make a little bit of a run, make some noise in the playoffs. And look, obviously, there, there has to be a little bit more done, but I, I could see uh, Alex Debrink being the, the centerpiece of the move that this team needs to make. And that's a dude who, like I said, two years ago in Chicago, he was unreal. Every time you turned on Sports Center, every time you turned on NHL Network, anytime you were watching any hockey highlights, it was this guy putting the puck in the back of the net. It, he's unreal. And you pair him with guys who can score, like a, like a Lucas Raymond, um, a couple of other pieces that the Red Wings have that can help, one, elevate his floor, but he can also help elevate their floor, and everybody's ceiling moves up. Next thing you know, you got some potential there. So I do believe Steve Eiserman makes a move. I do believe he's a bit of a traitor on draft day and over the draft weekend, and I think they do make a little bit of a splash. Nice. Speaking of splashes, the, the Pistons made a bit of a splash when they went out and hired Monty Williams. We had the presser on, uh, on Tuesday. Did you get anything out of, of this presser? Was there anything that you took from it? Was there anything that really stuck out to you? Because I heard the word restore a lot. Restore was the word of the day. I'm wonder, wondering if you got anything else other than restore out of uh, out of this presser. Yeah, I, I did. I think that obviously it's unfortunate in that you got a close tie too. And I'm not exactly sure here, but obviously through the playoffs, Monty Williams had a personal family matter that came up. And I, I don't know, did he tell Matt Ishbia that, hey, you know, I got a personal family matter with my wife going on. She's got a recent diagnosis of cancer. And what 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 can we do here? And I, I don't know if he revealed it, did not to reveal it, but for the optics for Monty Williams to say this, it really does kind of put Matt Ishbia in kind of a real bad situation. Like, damn, how cold blooded are you, man? You, 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 you might've known something with this guy's family and, and what happened and you still decided, I mean, maybe the agent would have said something, but uh, still blew him out of the water. And now you got this guy who maybe was leaning toward taking some time off and, and everybody would have, once that would have been discussed, would have, you know, if you got a $10 million golden parachute, and you got some family matters to attend to, why would you do this? And people were wondering, and, and that question was brought up, and he said, you know, it was great because Tom Gorris made a financial commitment to me. He also is going to let me use his private jet, some access, and there's going to be advanced opportunities with, with health care for my wife. So with all of that, in combination with being the highest paid, he said, look, I'm not going to just – actually, it made sense. He's like, if a guy's going to make me that much of an investment and pay me that much, I, I have to acknowledge it. It's just, he said, it's disrespectful not to talk about the money. He's like, uh, I'm doing it for the money as well. It's part of the reason I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. And it's the commitment that somebody made. And it's a very wise answer. And I just thought he was measured. And mm -hmm. I thought what, what I said was this. And, and, and I hate to say it this way, but I, I always spit it straight. The way in which I currently perceive Monty Williams is he's a bridge coach. Like, I don't see championship medal. I've seen him be out coached in the playoffs a couple times where some sets needed to be uh, adjusted and he didn't make the necessary adjustments, some question marks with how he treated star players and DeAndre Ayton. But I did see the ability to coach young players and get them to the postseason. So I would be thrilled. It would be right now my expectation – is Monty Williams gets them to the Eastern Conference Finals, and we go from there. I think that he has the, the pedigree to win playoff series, has the pedigree to develop talent. I just don't know at the highest level, can he take that necessary coaching step to match which with, a, with, with an Eric Spolstra, who is light years ahead of everybody. So it's no, mm -hmm. big, it's no big disrespect to say, oh my God, you got outcoached by Eric Spolstra. The man has worked with Pat Riley for decades and is just among the best coaches in the world. So I look at it and I say, okay, perfect bridge coach, perfect coach for the right time. And I think that, uh, I think that he, he was moved by his players being there. And I think that for 
a situation in which you're looking for a coach that has a relationship with Troy Weaver, this is the perfect marriage. You get Troy, Troy got his coach because yep. obviously Dwayne Casey was not going to ever be uh, somebody that is going to be someone's first choice. So Dw- Troy got his guy. And I think that you know, the other takeaway I had was, man, the owner, Tom Gores, was kind of making some weird references to disagreements with Troy Weaver. And it kind of looked awkward that people were like, these guys sound like a bitter married couple. And it, it's weird, like we're arguing and not arguing. And it just, it had the, the, the feeling of a weird vibe between Troy and Tom. But other than that, I'm happy with Monty Williams. I, I enjoy it. If you want to watch it and, and assess for yourself, go on YouTube and watch it. I thought it was very intriguing what we saw in that 45 minutes that he talked. So the one thing that I will say, I, I made, I, I mocked the word restore as it was used quite <laughs> restore, a bit during this press conference. Restore. <laughs> so I, I made, I made a little bit of a, of a joke about that when we opened this, this topic. But I think what I got out of this is a little bit of faith in Tom Gores has been restored in me. And that is in the fact that Obviously, this was a guy that that Tom wanted, right? Tom wanted this guy. It sounds like Troy wanted this guy. It sounds like they were both in agreement on this one guy. And because of that, Tom Gores went above and beyond. He he made him the highest paid coach. He offered him jet access in case anything happens to his wife or to his kids. He he boosted the 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 the, the medical coverage for the wife who is going through her own bout uh, of cancer. And it sounds like the way that they approach this situation sounds like Tom Gores did this the right way. You know, we normally make fun of Tom Gores because he shows up for, I don't know, one game every month or he shows up for one game every two months and he's hammered on the sidelines and he's getting the t-shirt cannon and he's shooting t-shirts into the crowd. And that's what you know him for. Like it's for being the drunk owner on the sideline, making a fool out of himself. It seems like he handled this with tact and with grace. Now, you can't really say the same thing about that press conference, but he handled this with tact and with grace and allowed Monty Williams the time to kind of work through these family issues, work through, work through issues with his wife and his wife's health. And then they came back and they revisited it. And they were like, look, if you need these things, we have these things. These are, these are all on the table. If you want this, it's here for you. And I love the fact that Tom Gores was willing to go above and beyond to go get his guy. What I don't necessarily like is, like you said, sounds like Tom Gore is a little bit meddling. Um, you kind of would like Troy Weaver to be the guy in control and not necessarily have the owner over him trying to move pieces around on the chessboard. Uh, but all that being said, every now and then the owner does have to step in and does have to lay down and write a check and say, look, this is what we're willing to spend. And if he needs more, come talk to me because I'm willing to do more. And I like the fact that the owner of the Detroit Pistons ponied up to the table and was like, whatever he needs, we got it. Get him here. He's the guy who's going to help get us to that next level. And whether that next level is just getting into the playoffs or whether that next level is making a legitimate run at winning a championship, I'm not sure. We're going to find out. But I do expect some growth from some of these players. Now what I need to see is I need to see a, a Troy Weaver go out there and do what Troy Weaver does. I need him to go find some talent, bring some guys in. make a, we, we talked about the Detroit Red Wings making a splash with free agency. I need to see Troy Weaver go out and make a little bit of a splash. Bring another guy in here for Monty Williams to work with and help develop some of these guys like bring a veteran in here because there's a thing that that is to be said about seeing the game through veteran eyes especially when you're a very young team and you have a very young core nucleus so i would like to see that get done by troy weaver but overall i have some faith restored in tom gores this is a guy who i regularly bag on Faith uh, before has we been get restored. out of here, do you want to do a <laughs> faith has been restored? <laughs> right. Oh man. Okay, real fast though, real fast. What would be a good good win total? Is it thirty? I think thirty is the number. You have to hit thirty wins. You gotta go thirty and fifty two. If you can't win thirty games, I'm not saying thirty four, but I, I heard some some projections where people were like, that's far too uh ambitious of an expectation. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's only 13 more games where you, you, you didn't mess up in the fourth quarter. The, the Pistons had leads and blew them. I think 30 and 52 is my first year mark for him. I think 32 wins and that's setting the bar really low. I think th- this team would have been a better team if you had Cade on the floor. Cade wasn't on the floor for the majority of the season. I think you add Cade. 
that adds at least seven games. I think the coaching from Monty Williams and getting this team to buy in and play defense, I think that can help get you a little bit more over the top. So I'm going to set the bar at 32, and I feel like that is setting it very low. If I had to pick, I would go over 32 for, for a win total next season. Okay, they're over 32. Uh, that's amb- I think you're being ambitious being that I might they, be. they don't play defense. They, they got, I mean, I, I don't know if a team can just – flip a script with a new coach this is this is the thing though defense is just effort that's all defense is uh, like, it's part of it but you, 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 you look at no you look you look at i'm one of the worst guys that you'll ever see on the basketball floor the one thing i brought to every team i ever played on was defense and it's just because it's hustle that's it i'm a hustle guy right i'm a try hard guy that's that's what defense is it's trying hard it's being in good position it's, it's understanding how the play is going and then just anticipating and being there. And if you get caught out of position, you need to hustle back and get back into position and try to make a play. That is all defense is. It's just try hard. Just go out there and try hard and work hard and try to be in position. A lot of times you see guys lax. You see guys sagging down low. You see guys with their hands down. You need your hands up. You need to be checking people. You need to be bodying people. When, when they go to the foul line, you need to be boxing guys out, making people pay for going to the rack. Like, like basketball can be a physical game. It doesn't necessarily always need to be finesse. It can be physical. And I'll argue that when it's more physical, it's more enjoyable to watch. Make guys pay, especially when you're not a very good team. Make them hesitate and question whether or not they really want to drive the lane and go to the rack. Make them really question that because – you go to the rack a couple times and you got an, an elbow or you got an arm or a hand coming down on you and the ref doesn't see it per se, we'll just say, you know, they're going to start questioning whether or not they want to do that. Next thing you know, they start pulling up and they start forcing jump shots. You know what that leads to? That leads to rebounds. You know what rebounds lead to? That leads to transitional basketball with points coming back the other way. So it, there are things that can be done. Defense is just trying hard and being positioned. And if you're talented, you generally are a much better defender. Okay. Okay. Now, before we get out of here, we got to check in with the Tigers. Had an opportunity to go down there on Friday against Arizona, and it was great, man. My nephew, uh, it, it sucks, and it speaks to the times. He's like, oh, I'm a big Diamondbacks fan. I know what's up. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, dude, what's wrong with you? You do a podcast, you don't know that uh, Carol's going to be the upcoming rookie of the year? I'm like, nephew. I follow Detroit sports hardcore. I don't care about the Arizona. Di- <laughs> I don't care about the Arizona Diamondbacks. And he's like. Uncle, you got to check out this guy. He's awesome. I'm like, okay. So we get there and have a good time. And of course, like a moron, we pick it the day that Taylor Swift was down there. And that's a whole other thing that I can recap next time. That was crazy to see what I saw down there. But get into Comerica Park early. We planned it. It was good. Uh, Everything was smooth. And it it was enjoyable. And I sit down. And the the, the Carol from the Diamondbacks has a very weird – uh, ritual in the batter's box where imagine a batter that obviously he's standing and he's wiggling his hips left and right, left and right. You know, he's not swaying. He's actually wiggling his ass. And so I caught a great moment where it was quiet, right? When he like, just before, you know, uh, he hits a home run and it's real quiet. And I'm like, why are you shaking your ass <laughs> real loud? And I was that guy having a good time. The beers are expensive, but they were finally, uh, the peanuts were fresh, which was a blessing, and the beer was cold. But he hit a, it was, uh, the two games I've been there the, down there this year have been awesome. It was an 11 6 loss. I had the best time. Um, Jake Rogers shaved his Fu Manchu porn stash, and he hit two home runs. Carroll hit a grand slam. Uh, he hit uh, an opening inning home run. The, the Tigers lost, but it was entertaining, and it was a, 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 a wild night. The crowd booed the Tigers because, uh, I get it, because of the air quality and because there was so much foot traffic, they canceled the fireworks, and the crowd booed mercilessly for three minutes, and it sucked because part of the reason why we like going down there on Fridays is fireworks, but it was still fun, an 11-6 loss, but but in all seriousness, I was jealous. I looked at the Diamondbacks, and it was just like a smooth-hitting lineup, guys with averages 270 and above. They got a young cat that's 21 years old that can hit the ball, that is super talented. They had pitching staff that can get guys out. They looked like a reasonable team, and I was like, man, I'm impressed. They played very well in Detroit, and uh, they had Marte. They had they have a bunch of young talent that is really going to do some stuff. And, they, and the, the ball boys were cool. 
they gave us uh, three game used balls. So the nephew had a good time for his birthday. We got to drink some Coors Light and ate some popcorn. And and then the best part was there was like four hot Latinas sitting behind us that uh, <laughs> the person I was sitting with was rocking a Rolex so that they, they were looking at him. And uh, so just me, like I staring at all these ladies, they were smiling and I don't know what they were doing, but I don't know if they're looking at him or whatever, but it was fun to just check back. I don't know if they were girlfriends of the guys on the team, but uh, I enjoyed my time there because um, they were singing and I don't know if they came to get lit or they just thought that they could get Taylor Swift tickets and just walked into a ballpark uh, already having a good time. But it was fun. It was good atmosphere. Um, and it was best because uh, when, you, when you go down with sports fans, it's always fun. My nephew loves baseball and he could tell me everything about the Diamondbacks. So it sucks. I'm just jealous because I would have loved for him to be super – he's hardcore obviously about baseball. But he gravita- he's a fair weather fan. He gravitates towards the good teams. And he knows, yeah. he knows obviously, about Riley Green and Torkelson. But uh, he's not going to give a shit about, um, you know, McKinstry or Jake Rogers or, you know, any of the pitchers on the Tigers. You know, he knows them, but he's hardcore into the good teams. And I, I, I give him credit. I, I get it. Why, why worry about a, a baseball team that's under 500 that can win one game every 10 games and they're about to lose probably the second game to the, to the Braves? And it sucks because... In, in in the end, Javi Baez is terrible, and the offense is is in a dumpster. is in, is horrible right now. And uh, the word of the week for me with the Tigers is jealousy. I'm just jealous that teams that have started to build in the right way are way ahead of the Tigers right now. Yeah, I, I think this past week kind of gives you an idea of just how far away they really are. I mean, you took in the Diamondbacks game. The Diamondbacks were a team that two years ago were one of the worst teams in the league. And now they've got at least some entertaining players. They've got some actual MLB ball players. You go up and down this roster, you're going to be hard pressed to find actual major league ball players. Javi Baez is not a major league ball player. Javi Baez is maybe a triple a guy he swings at too many pitches, strikes out way too much, doesn't draw nearly enough walks sometimes is a liability in the field. It's just, it's frustrating. And that's, that's your big name. That's your guy. Riley green, Riley green is, is good. Right. And the hope is Riley green really establishes himself and and can take off. Riley green's hurt right now. And and Riley green is nowhere near what Nolan Carroll is for the diamondbacks, you know? So it, it just, you, you, you just have a team that is so far behind the eight ball I just don't know if they ever really catch up. And I don't know if they ever, if it's, if the process is ever going to really end because it just feels like you are just in, in perpetuity where you're just kind of running in place. Like I have faith in this front office. I think this front office will be able to get it together, but man, it just feels like it is, it is so far away. It's not like it's around the corner. It's not like it's going to happen in the next year or two. It really does feel like this is a a three, four, maybe even a five year rebuild because this team is so bad right now, which makes this trade deadline so interesting because you don't have anything. You, you've got nothing. Nothing. But you do have some pitchers. You do have some guys that might be coveted around the league. Can you move some of these pitchers for positional players? And I think going into the trade deadline, I think that is the one thing that that this team and this Tigers front office has to really investigate and really look at moving some of this pitching staff and just kind of chalking the season up as a loss and going out and getting some positional players that can hit their way out of a, pa- a wet paper bag because they legit don't have anything. Torkelson is is utterly disappointing. Torkelson is is he's not where any of us expected him to be and I don't know if he'll ever be the player that we expected him to be. There's still hope for Riley Green, but after that, man, you are hard pressed on this team for anything of, of, of note as far as a positional player goes. So it's just a, a very frustrating Tiger season right now. Yeah, absolutely. And next week, stay tuned to the latest Doc and Jock. Well, we'll explore should the Tigers in our temperature check, should they dip into the minors and bring up some guys? Colton Keith, should they bring up a guy that's hitting? Should they bring up a triple-A player that is heating up as well? Um, A.J. Hinch said, not so fast, hold your horses. We aren't going to do it. But should he? Should he take a look at just replacing the crumb bums that are on the big league roster and just see what you got with the with the young cats? 
We'll explore that and look at the week that is on next week's Detroit Sports Podcast with Doc and Jock. So we'll see how the week progresses. Now we have an opportunity to take a pause from the Lions and really look to the off seasons of the Pistons and Red Wings and and look at the Tigers and things like that and other sporting topics as we um, now have a little break in the action with the NFL, which is good. It's much needed. Six weeks until training camp in late July where the Lions will resume. And then guess what? Because pads come on and that's where the hitting starts and that's where the good action and the competition is going to come because not only are the Lions going to hold one team, uh, not only are they going to host one team, they're hosting two NFL teams at Allen Park for practices. So it's going to be a fun time. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you've agreed or disagreed with any of the content this week, hit us up, let us know, and we'll be happy to engage in quality sports debates. Appreciate everybody. Make sure you like and subscribe. We appreciate all the supporters and listeners of Doc and Jock.